And right now we take the authority that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and we bind the powers in the heavenlies. We bind the principalities and powers of wickedness and darkness. We bind every spirit that would try to move into this auditorium tonight over this campground. We drive you back in the name of Jesus. Every hindering spirit, every distracting spirit, every confusing spirit, every contrary spirit, in the name of Jesus, every spirit of unbelief, every spirit of doubt, we bind you now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, while you're setting your things up there, uh, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp took it on ourselves here quite some time ago to support Brother Parrish in Guatemala monthly. And we, this year, have, we did support them with $100 a month. We felt to make it $200 a month from the income that comes into here from your support. We, we support Guatemala with $200 a month. And uh, if any of you would feel uh, that the Lord would have you to uh, uh, have, send an offering for uh, uh, Brother Parrish, you send it, and we'll see that he gets it. We'll give you a receipt for it, a donation for it. And our offering tonight was $1,500, which will go in its entirety to Guatemala. Praise the Lord. How many of you are here in the camp for the first session of this week's camp? Some of you are new tonight. I know several are here. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome. We uh, realize that some of you are becoming to realize that the camp is almost over. And uh, the same thing is happening here that happens most places where we go to minister. We'll get down to the, close to the end of our deliverance camps. People begin to get concerned. I wonder if I'm going to get all that I'm supposed to get <laughs> before this camp's over. And a few new ones have come in and wondered, well, am I, am I going to get mine? But well, we're going to believe God to really meet some needs. A lot of people are press, pressing in to Ida May and I and Brother Parrish and saying, can we have personal deliverances? Well, I wish it were possible to minister one-on-one -on -one to each one of you. I heard Brother Norman saying this last night, that there's no substitute for that one-on-one -on -one kind of deliverance. But this is one reason we are seeking to emphasize in this camp the importance of bringing out the whole spiritual body as spiritual warriors. We've had services here where we've laid hands on you to receive the impartation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that will equip you to minister to others. And maybe this is the night God wants a lot of that to be put into practice because we need to learn how to move and how to minister to one another. We need to realize that each one of us, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do have authority over the powers of the enemy. And we need to begin more and more to use our own authority, even in spiritual warfare, in our own behalf. There are some things that we need to know. There are some things that we need to understand. And this is one thing we've sought to do this week, is to pour into you as much information as we can to bring forth the Word of God so you can see how the devil works, so that you'll be able to enter in more intelligently in spiritual warfare for yourself and for others. I was thinking about the ministry of Jesus as it tells us in the ninth chapter of Matthew, beginning in all about uh, verse 32, it says, they, uh, As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb man spake and so on. It goes ahead to describe what Jesus was doing in ministry one day. He was in the ministry of deliverance. It says in verse 35 that he went about their villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So he was preaching, teaching, casting out devils, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I want you to take notice of who was doing this. Jesus himself. And he was in the full spectrum of his ministry. And yet at the end of that day, listen to what he said. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. He looked upon these to whom he had just ministered, and his heart just moved in deep compassion because he knew they had continuing needs. You know, we can minister to everybody's need in one day, and yet 
if we were able to do that completely, tomorrow there would be fresh needs. And Jesus realized that. So he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers <coughs> into his harvest. Jesus said we need to pray <coughs> me, that there will be more people as his servants that will be moving into the fields and doing the work. There's just a few deliverance ministers that I know of who are at large in the body of Christ teaching and ministering deliverance. There needs to be more. Most of us who are teaching, we have other responsibilities. I'm supposed to be pastoring a church back in Texas. And my people wonder. I heard one of my members ask somebody recently, Who is my pastor? Where is my pastor? Because he hadn't seen him so long, he just wondered if he still had a pastor. And Brother Norman, he has, you can see all of the responsibility that he has in Central and South America with the churches and the great work that God is using him for down there. So continue to pray, people, that the Lord of the harvest <coughs> will send forth laborers into the field. And, and don't be surprised if he sends you. Now look at chapter 10 in the first verse. And, because that context continues right on. And when he had called his disciples, his twelve, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Immediately after Jesus said it's time to pray that the Lord of the harvest will thrust out laborers, he did that very thing. He took his twelve and he thrust them out into the field. And he equipped them, didn't he? We saw the other day that when Jesus gives us something to do, he equips us. God has been equipping you this week, not only in your understanding, but he has been quickening you and equipping you by the empowering of his Holy Spirit to impart unto you the gifts that you need to do the work that needs to be done. There's a vast need today. Jesus is coming soon. He's preparing His church. He's preparing this world. The kingdom of Satan is being overthrown, and the kingdom of God is being established. His kingdom is going to come on earth even as it is in heaven. And we have a part in that. And the ministry of warfare and the ministry of deliverance is preparing and leading in to the time when Jesus shall come back and rule and reign, and we'll have a thousand years when the devil is bound, and we have a complete time of peace and rest and joy and love, and we won't have to cast out any devils for a thousand years. Isn't that going to be a glorious time? I'm looking forward to that, aren't you, Brother Norman? <laughs> Hallelujah. But our work here, we can take a vacation from it for a thousand years. Well, glory to God. I need to share with you something this, tonight that is very important and something that's very basic. I, I usually share this somewhere along. I thought, well, this will be one camp when I won't teach this, but the Lord just won't leave it alone. He says, I've got to present it to you. And it's one of the most important teachings that the Lord has given to us as far as deliverance teaching is concerned. I want to teach you what the Lord has shown us about what we call the schizophrenia revelation. Some of you have heard this before, but I make no apologies for repeating it to those of you who have heard it. Because those of you who are going to be working in the ministry of deliverance, this can be one of the most valuable tools in your hands. If you haven't heard this tonight, I want you to listen with all of the intensity that the Holy Spirit will give you. Because I don't have time in the allotted time tonight to devote in every detail, in every illustration, to enlarge. I'm just asking God to bring what we especially need to hear tonight, that we might see the, the very basis of what God has for us in, in this thing that God showed us quite a few years ago. It has, it has been used in our ministry repeatedly. What I'm going to share with you tonight is something that you can use every day. Every day it can be of value to you. It can be valuable to you personally, and it can be valuable to you in your relationship to other people. Many other deliverance ministries have received this insight, and they have begun to incorporate it into their ministries, and, and they are finding the value of this re revelation for themselves. Now, a lot of the things that have happened to us in our lives have affected our personalities. And what I'm sharing with you tonight has to do with the healing 
of our personalities. If you cut your foot, you know that you would need to take care of that wound and be sure that it didn't get infected. You would want to dress that wound and be sure that it was protected and you would do that because you knew the importance of it. Now, just like you know the importance of treating a wound that you get externally, we need to realize the importance of dealing with wounds that we get in internally. Many of you, most of you, maybe all of us here tonight, have been wounded. Some of you have been wounded more than others, and you've been hurt on the inside. And if that wound that you received, maybe it was back when you were a little child, Maybe it was 10 or 15 or 20 or more years ago that you received some wound inside of you and you were hurt deeply. If you didn't protect that, and maybe you didn't know how to protect it, maybe you didn't know how to cleanse that wound, then an infection got into that wound. A spiritual infection got into that wound. And that spiritual infection is called a demon spirit. And when one has an internal wound and a demon spirit of infection, that old unclean thing gets in there, then there is a compounded problem. There is not only the original wound, but there is the infection that is associated with that wound. Now here is where a big part of the deliverance ministry has its emphasis in dealing with the wounds that people have had in the course of their life. Wounds that weren't treated. Wounds that never have really healed. There may be a patch over it, but down underneath, it never has really been thoroughly and completely dealt with, and healing hasn't completely taken place. Now, if that spiritual infection is in that wound, the first thing that's got to take place is the removal of that spiritual infection, the removal of that evil spirit, the casting out of that demon that comes in to bring his contamination into that wound. And then after that evil spirit is gone out, then that wound can be healed. I'm believing the Lord for a tremendous ministry in this place tonight. I've asked God, God, our time is running out and there's so much that needs to be done. And there are people here yet with very real and very deep needs in their life. Lord, I just ask you again right now, just take my tongue and anoint it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let not one, one word be wasted tonight, Lord. But let all things be done by the leadership and empowerment of your Holy Spirit. We invite your Spirit now, Lord, to quicken to our understanding the things that we need to hear tonight, that the enemy might be completely exposed, and that he might be defeated in each of our lives, and that he might be driven from our lives, and all of those wounds completely cured and completely healed. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Years ago, when we had soon been in the ministry of deliverance. We'd only been in deliverance perhaps or oh, somewhere around three years getting involved in it. You know, God began to, to move right from the first, giving us words of knowledge and discerning of spirits. And we got so blessed by seeing things happen. I tell you, when you've pastored for 20 years and didn't see much happen, it really does get exciting when you see things happen. When you see needs really met. You know, I used to tell people, well... You know, I know you've got big problems. You just need to come to church more regularly, read your Bible, and join training union. That will really help you, you know. And so we told them all the things they needed to do, you know, that we knew to tell them. But people never did really get help. I always was frustrated trying to counsel people back in those early years of my ministry. But when we got into the deliverance ministry, here were people that we found out had demons in them, and you could cast those demons out. And then they'd get stabilized in their personalities. They'd begin to get joy and peace in their life. And we just got plumb excited about that. But you know, then our balloon got punctured. We saw that there were some of the people that came for us for the ministry of deliverance that though we did the very best we knew how, they didn't get victory in their life. Or at least they didn't get a permanent victory in their life. And you know, when, you, when you're close to somebody like that, and, and you just are doing your best, and they're doing their best to cooperate, and they still don't get through to the victory that we know Jesus has for them, you know, you say, well, what else can we do? So we had gotten to that condition with a lady in our fellowship, and she just believed in deliverance, and she was wanting to be used of the Lord. In fact, she was used to the Lord. The gifts of the Spirit and all of that flowed through her. She was a tremendous blessing by bringing new spiritual songs all the time. 
But yet in her life, she was so unstable. She could just go into an instant upheaval. And it upset her family. It upset the church and everything else. So we had worked with her repeatedly. And one night there was another one of those upheavals. And Adam and I were just defeated in our hearts. And we went to bed just saying, well, it's no use. This deliverance thing is just not working. And we were just ready to shelve the whole thing and to say, well, we've got to find something else. But that night, God in His grace. You know, God sees every need. Maybe some of you don't realize how much God really sees your need. You know, some of you have cried for a long time for answers for yourself or answer for somebody in your family, and you haven't found the full answer. I want you to know that God has heard your prayer. God sees your need. God loves you. Or if you can just lay hold of that tonight and know and be patient with the Lord. And sometimes you have to be patient with yourself until you come in to all. I mean, you know, it took most of us a long time to get in the messes we're in. So let's be patient with the Lord if it takes a little while for Him to work us out of it. Because we have, as we've seen this week, we have a lot of discipline to work in our life. We're not finding something that's just a simple little snap of the finger and all of a sudden all the dark clouds vanish and we're just burst into the sunshine. But if you'll be willing to apply yourself and be teachable and follow the instruction of the Lord, then God will bring you out of those woods. He'll honor your faith. He'll honor your obedience. Now, God waked Adam A up in the night when we'd gone to bed so discouraged over this particular situation and he began to speak to her. You know, that's precious when God just begins to speak. Sometimes He speaks when you less expected Him to. Now, what He told Adam A was going to be so helpful, not only to this woman, but to many others. Some people have said to Adam A, well, how long did you fast and pray before you received that from the Lord? She said, well, I didn't fast and pray at all. Said, In fact, I went to bed mad at God. You know, <laughs> God's great. But the woman, you know, we give the glory and praise to God for the woman that needed this help because she was praying and she was fasting. And God honored that, and he dropped the revelation on Adam A that night. And he waked Adam A up, and he said, Well, Sarah, her problem is that she's a schizophrenic. Well, Adam A didn't know what that was. And so God began to tell her what schizophrenia was. He says it, uh, it is a system of evil spirits that affect the development of one's personality. He says it represents a disturbance or a distortion or a disintegration of one's personality. Now, you can see that those words represent a possible progression. A person may have within their personality merely a disturbance, but it can move on into a distortion of personality or ultimately even to the point of a disintegrated personality. If a person is disintegrated in personality, usually they are removed from society. They are locked up in an institution somewhere and are unable to function in relationship with other people. So this was our first initial understanding about this problem. Now, God began to show her. He gave Adam a, a visual thing. He, he had her to draw a diagram of her hands. And Adam a went aside and spent a little while with the Lord, about 30 or 40 minutes. And during that time... He told Adam A to write on that little diagram of the outline of her two hands the names of all of the spirits that were in Sarah. And the Spirit of God told her which demons to list on certain fingers. And when all the fingers were labeled, then he had her to list the names of other demons down the hands. And so there was a diagram that was provided. Now, this turned out to be the key to Sarah's deliverance. Although she had had a lot of other deliverance, it never had been totally effective because we hadn't gotten to the root spirits. We hadn't really dealt with the strong men. What is the principle we see in Matthew chapter 12 of spiritual warfare? First, bind the strong man and then spoil his house. Now, this is true if we're going to take a city for the Lord if we're going to take a nation for the Lord, or if we're going to take an individual for the Lord. You still have to deal with the strong man before Satan's house and work can be spoiled. So this revelation was important to call to our attention the place of the strong man and the need to deal with the strong man. 
Now, through this, we were able eventually to minister to Sarah and to see her get free, to see her delivered from the problem that the world calls schizophrenia. Now, I wanted to know, after this revelation came, I wanted to know if it had any scriptural basis. Us old Baptist boys like Norman and I, some of the rest of you, you know, we had some good teaching back there. We had some teaching that said all that we believe and all that we practice is based on the Word of God. That's our authority for what we do. And so that's good, that's good practice till this day. Test it by the Word of God. If you see, receive a prophecy, if you receive any insight that you feel like from God, test it by the Word of God. If it's not true to the Word of God, you can just throw it away. But if it's in the Word of God, then you can know that it is of God and you can be confident in following that which the Lord has shown you. Now, in this revelation, God said it was schizophrenia. Well, I couldn't think anywhere in the Bible where it mentions schizophrenia. And so I just waited before the Lord, and I said, Lord, I want you to show me if there's anything like this in your Word. Because God said that this thing represented a system of spirits. You see, when I first got into deliverance, I couldn't think any larger terms than one demon at a time. You know, if somebody had a demon, well, that was just about as much as my little pea brain could assimilate. But after a while, I began to see that there were more than one demon that could be in a person. And in fact, I began to understand, Dr. Prince was teaching this, that demons ran in gangs or colonies or families of spirits. The spirits of a like nature would work together in a grouping of spirits. Well, that was a new insight. And then the next step in my spiritual understanding was that there are systems of spirits. In fact, there is a demonic kingdom. Satan has a demonic kingdom. See, he parallels everything God has. God has a kingdom, so the devil says, I'm going to have a kingdom. And he tries to operate his kingdom somewhat like God operates his. And so Satan has prince spirits that work under him, and then under those spirits there are others until you get down, like in the ranks, you get down to the buck private in Satan's army. Well, we've been, we had been dealing with Satan's buck private. God says, you've got to deal with some of those in the higher echelon. So, now, when Satan tries to rule, say he wants to rule the world, well, he's established ruler spirits over nations, like we see in the, in the book of Daniel, the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, which were demonic ruler spirits over those nations. Now, what you need to understand tonight is that he does the same thing when he tries to set up his kingdom rule in the life of any individual. He wants to set up a ruler spirit over that person, and he wants to get helpers in there and link them in together. So when we're in the ministry of deliverance, we are not dealing with isolated spirits. We're not dealing with just a spirit of anger over here and a spirit of lust over there and a spirit of fear somewhere else that have no relationship to each other. We are dealing with a kingdom of spirit. We're dealing with a system of spirit where these spirits are linked together and it can be seen in a very logical way as to how they are related one to another. Satan's kingdom, it says again in Matthew 12, is not divided. And evil spirits, I saw this early in my ministry, how tenaciously they worked together and how they supported one another and helped one another when we were in spiritual battle against them. And so this is what we're against. We're against that system of spirit within you. You know, the devil hasn't overlooked a one of you. It says in the Word of God that God has a plan for your life. We call it the plan of salvation. Well, the devil comes along with his alternate plan. See, God has a plan. He has a plan. God's plan encompasses each person that lives on the face of the earth. God purposes salvation and has provided salvation for everybody. The devil says, well, I have a plan for everybody. It's a horrible plan. It's a plan of death. It's a plan of destruction. And he hasn't overlooked a single one of us. You said, well, I thought if I didn't notice him, maybe he wouldn't notice me. I used to think that. But all it does is just give him an opportunity to work without being challenged. He has noted you and he has sought to set up his kingdom within you. Just like God says, I will put my spirit in you. Satan says, I will put my spirit or spirits in you and I will rule from inside of you. And some of us are beginning to find out just how far down the trail old Satan got to carry out his diabolical plan. 
But isn't it wonderful today that he's being exposed? It's good to know what the devil's doing. It's good to be able to come somewhere near of what Paul said, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. You know, we've been too ignorant about what the devil is up to. But God is drawing the drapes. And we're looking in and seeing what the devil is trying to do to me and you. So I want you to be thinking concerning yourself. Sometimes when I preach, people say, I wish so-and-so were here. Well, you're here tonight, and I want you to be thinking in terms of yourself and what Satan has tried to gain as far as your own life is concerned. Now, this thing of schizophrenia, we've got this little diagram here, and we'll be looking at it a while tonight. Now, look up here. You see that word schizophrenia? You know, in the world, that's a horrible word. It means mental illness, cause unknown, cure uncertain. It's a Greek word. The Greek word is schizo, which means divided, and phrenia, which is the Greek word for mind. It literally means a person with a divided mind. Now, there is a parallel word to that in the Scripture. And this is what I was looking for, that parallel in the Word of God. In, in James 1.8 is one place where this word occurs. It says there that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The person who is double-minded is saying of that person the same thing that the word schizophrenia says. In fact, that word double-minded is, is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's made up of two words. It's a compound word. And the two words translated double-minded literally are two souls. So we could read it that way. A person with two souls is unstable in all his ways. Now, we've been talking about the soul this week and the need to discipline the soul. The soul encompasses the mind, the emotions, and the will. So a person who has two ways of thinking, two different ways of feeling, two different ways of deciding is an unstable person. They have a divided mind, or they have a divided personality. Again, I saw something very interesting in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, where it begins to talk about the Christian armor and the spiritual warfare. And it says, "...to put on the whole armor of God, that we may stand against the wiles of the devil." You know what we stand against when we stand against his wiles? The word in Greek for wiles is methodia. And that's where we get our English word method. So it literally means that we must put on the whole armor of God to stand against the methods and the settled plans of the enemy. That is most important for you to see. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and we put on the whole armor of God that we may stand against the settled plan, the methods of the devil. Now, he has settled different, uh, certain plans to try to capture us. He started a plan in the Garden of Eden, and what God has shown me is that Satan hasn't changed his original plan. He's still seeking to do with us what he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, there again, the next verse in Ephesians 6, verse 12, where it says we wrestle against principalities. The word principalities, the root word there is arche. And the word arche literally means things in a series, the order of things such as rank. So there again, we see that we're not dealing with just isolated, unrelated spirits, but we're dealing with spirits that are associated in connection and in rank. They are related and linked together one with another. Then we find in the book of Genesis where it tells us of Satan coming into the garden to tempt Eve that he came in there to ask Eve a question. Now that sounds innocent enough. Anybody ought to hold, be able to hold up to the devil when he asks us a question. He said to Eve something like this. We'll paraphrase. He said, Eve, is it really true that God told you that you can't eat of all the trees that are in this garden. Can you see the way he asked that question was to plant a doubt in her mind about what God said? See, he wanted to make her double-minded, to have two different opinions about what God had said. So that question was designed to cause her to doubt, to waver and to question and be indecisive about something very plain that God had said. And we know the outcome. Eve became double-minded, and she partook of the forbidden fruit because that question caused her to doubt 
God's Word? Should I really believe God's Word? Satan says, don't believe that. Look at that fruit. It's good. See, God doesn't really love you. If He did, He wouldn't keep that from you. And so she was tempted, and she ate of the fruit. Eve was the first schizophrenic. She was the first double-minded person on the face of this earth. Now, we find Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 writing to the church at Corinth and saying that he is concerned about them. In verse 3, he says, I, I am concerned lest the same thing happen to you that happened to Eve, that you be corrupted in your minds from the simplicity which is in Christ. It says, even as Eve was deceived, I am concerned that you too will be deceived by the subtleties of Satan and that you will become double-minded like Eve was, corrupted from the simplicity or the singleness of your mind. So Satan had started his plan in the Garden of Eden, was still carrying it on in New Testament days, and is still carrying it on today. Satan seeks to make every one of us double-minded. If he can get you out of faith in what God's Word has said, he can capture you. We must never question the Word of God. We must not allow the devil to cause us to raise questions about what God has said. The moment that question comes in, we're in trouble. Neither must we question God's love. Oh, the devil hates God's love. I appreciate, Brother Norm, that helped me today when you were talking about love as a weapon. I never have taught that, but I practice it all the time. When I minister to somebody, I get in their ear and, and I start saying, you devil, God loves this person. Jesus died for this person. Even while they were a sinner, God loved them. And we love them. And they're surrounded by love. And they got a lot of people that love. And those devils, yeah, you know, boy, they just, they're ready to go. I mean, they hate to hear about that love. And the devil hates love. That's the reason he stands against love. You know, when God starts building his kingdom, he builds it on a foundation of love. Good old John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Romans 5 eight. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us. And He builds His kingdom. He approaches us through love. He builds a relationship through His love. No wonder the devil begins at the opposite point. Look up here. And you see on this finger here the spirits of rejection. There are three of them. Rejection is the opposite of love. It is the tearing down of love. It is the denial of love. Here is where Satan always starts his attack against one's personality. The spirits of rejection are root spirits. Don't ever forget that. Whenever you're ministering to someone, you're going to find if they've got instability in their personality, you will always, always, every time, you will find demons of rejection. And most of them got early into that person's life. Because the devil knows that if he's going to set up his plan in a person's life, he's got to defeat love. He's got to overcome love and throw love down. Now, the devil will try to get in as soon as he can. How soon can he get in? Demons can enter a person from the point of conception onward, even while they're still in the mother's womb. Is that fair? Is that fair for a demon to indwell a person before they're born? Well, whoever said the devil was fair? He's a dirty fighter. He'll not stoop to any tactic or any opening that he can get to get into a person's life. You know, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. The devil says, okay, God can put his spirit in before a person's born. I'll put my spirit in before a person's born. Now, know that a devil can't get in just because he wants in. There has to be an opening. There has to be a way of entrance for that spirit to get in. There has to be a wound, for example. And he can get in through a wound. So if a parent discovers that, a, or a potential parent, discovers that a baby is on the way and doesn't want that baby, then they have rejected the birth of their child. And that is a wound in the fetus of that unborn child which will open the door for an evil spirit to come in. So we minister to people from their mother's womb, and we see manifestations of evil spirits leaving out of children that are still in their mother's bodies. And most of the spirits that are in the mother's bodies 
or spirits like rejection because the child wasn't wanted. Well, why wouldn't the child be wanted? Well, perhaps it was an illegitimate conception conceived out of wedlock. Maybe it was just a lust experience that two people had had together and conception took place. And they did not want to have a child. They were just going to have a lustful experience. So that child would be rejected. Maybe it's because it was in a family where finances were tough. And they said, we can't afford another baby. And so they rejected when they heard that a baby was on the way. Maybe the wife and husband were having conflict with each other. And they said, oh my, with all this trouble and now a baby's on the way. Maybe the, maybe the child's father had just died. And the, and the mother finds out, well, here's a baby and the husband has just been killed or something. So you can see there are many, many reasons why that one could be pregnant and the child be rejected by mother or father or both. Now, that opens the wound for that spirit of rejection to get in. Now, after a child is born, when it's first born, sometimes it's not wanted. You know, one of the most common reasons why children are not wanted at the time of birth is because the child is the wrong sex preference. Now, this actually happened to me. My mother... She so wanted to have a girl. She actually ended up with three sons and no daughters. I was the second son to be born. Now, since I'd had a brother born ahead of me, my mother knew I had to be a girl. And so she picked out a girl's name for me. She didn't even pick out a boy's alternate name. And when I was born and she looked at me, she knew Nellie Catherine wasn't going to fit me. And she looked around. It took her two and a half weeks to find a name for me. And I didn't know why I had so many problems in my life until later in life when I came into an understanding of the work of evil spirits and got delivered from the spirit of rejection that came into me when I was born. I was a disappointment. My mother told me many times during my life what a disappointment I was because she wanted me to be a girl and how unhappy she was that I didn't turn out to be a girl. Well, that really makes you feel good, doesn't it? To know that you were a disappointment to your parent. Now, after a child is born, he may have physical defects or... I'll tell you something else we need to deal. We're dealing much more with this in the realm of deliverance. We're dealing with spirits that come in through birthing experiences. And a lot of these spirits that come into people come into them through what takes place when they are born. Now, sometimes they're birth complications. Sometimes there, there are things that are traumas in birth. Maybe the cord's wrapped around or the baby is too long in the birth canal and other complications that can arise in birth. But I tell you, I am convinced more and more as we get into deliverance to see the spirits that have come in because of the treatment that people get in hospitals during birthing experience. As Dr. Mendelson says, having a baby is not sickness. Pregnancy is not a disease. And, and doctors, all they know is to treat disease. And so they treat most people who are having a baby like they were sick and had some kind of a disease. And so they interfere with a lot of things in the birthing process. Now, when a mother's got that baby in her womb, whatever she takes into her body goes directly into that child. If that mother has drugs and shots and things like that, it, it affects that child. We find a lot of the children that are being born today that are hyperactive, or some of them that are listless, some of them that are, they just start crying from the moment they are born, that those things are because of drugs that were put into that baby through the mother's veins to stop or slow down the process of labor to meet the schedule of the doctor or to give other shots to accelerate the pace of the labor so that the child will come so the doctor won't be late getting home from work that night. Now, there are a lot of these terrible things that will be done. A child has been carried in the warmth of his mother's womb for nine months. And all of a sudden, he is jerked out of that womb, taken away from his mother and the familiar sounds of her body, and thrust in an isolated room over there called a hospital nursery for the children. Separated from the mother. That ministers instant rejection to that baby. And many of you have received rejection because you were not permitted to stay with your mother at the time of your birth and were removed. We deal with that all of the time. So here is one of the ways that that spirit of rejection enters. Now, how we're treated on in life. If a child is belittled, if a child is treated cruelly, if a child is abused, that can minister more rejection to that child. And some of you were abused. Some of you were hurt. Some of you have been rejected by other experiences that you've had in life. You can remember experiences you had in school where others 
rejected you and you were hurt. It was a teacher or other children who rejected you in your peer group. Some of you had the suffering uh, of the hurts of rejection uh, in experiences with those of the opposite sex and in courtship experiences or in uh, engagement experiences or in uh, marriage experiences where those things didn't work out. You see, here's one of the things. The two, a boy and a girl get together and they start dating. You know, dating's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. They didn't do it that way. This is a modern invention. And you know, the reason, the reason that I, I, I counsel my young people, you know, don't get involved on this one-in-one -one and go on steady basis. Now, the world puts all kinds of pressure on you to do that. But look, if you get going steady with somebody, it either ends in marriage or rejection. That's the only two ways it can come out. And I, I would spare our young people a lot of unnecessary hurts that they get involved. They get their emotions extended. They get all involved with somebody else. They get air castles built up and fantasies about what the future is going to hold. And all of a sudden that thing becomes crushed and the result is deep hurt. We're casting many demons of hurt out of people that got hurt through those kind of experiences back earlier in their life. All right, so that's the spirit of rejection. The other spirits on that finger were the spirits of self-rejection and fear of rejection. Now, the fear of rejection means the person just has a fear that he's not going to be loved. He, he's afraid that if he gets too close to other people, they're not going to accept him. Now, this is what causes people to become paranoid. You know, we're always looking for the root. Don't just look for the surface problem. See, people come in and they start telling me their problems and why they need deliverance. And I say, well, yeah, you need deliverance from that, but that's a leaf on the tree. See, you, you look at every leaf and it's got a stem. Every stem's got a twig. Every twig's got a limb. Every limb finally is attached to the trunk of the tree. But you still haven't gotten to the business working into that tree until you deal with the roots of the tree. And they're out of sight. And, and that's the way it is with the problems we have, people. We see our surface problem. We see leaves and twigs and limbs, but we really don't get down most of the time and see the roots of our problem. And we, we can't get rid of a demonic tree unless we kill the roots. You know, the fig tree that Jesus dealt with is an illustration of that. He says the disciples came back and they saw that it was dead from the roots. So we're looking for roots tonight. We're not just looking for surface problems. A person who is afraid that other people won't like them, that is a root. Now, you can see a person who's jealous, who's envious, who's suspicious, who's distrustful, who has a fear of being persecuted. Those are all characteristics of a paranoid person. But the root of that thing is a fear of being rejected. Here's the person who's afraid other people won't like him. So what does he do? He feels everybody out. Now, I've got to know before I get too close to him how he's going to treat me, whether he's going to accept me or not. So we go feel him out. Now, don't let him get too... See, we talk about hold him at the arm's length. Let's hold him out there until we know what they're going to be, how they're going to react towards us. Now, the person, you see, who is being felt out gets uncomfortable with that. So why is he treating me like that? Why is he holding me at arm's length? Why won't he really accept me and let me get close to him? And so the person being felt out said, well, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I think I'll go find somebody else to relate to. And so what do they do? They reject that person that has the feeler out. And the reason he has the feeler out is because he's afraid he's going to be rejected. So the very thing that he feared came upon him. And the old cycle is set up. The old treadmill is set in motion. Rejection begets rejection. So you look on the thumbs on that diagram and you see the uh, paranoid spirits. There you see the right out of that fear of rejection comes jealousy and envy. Well, there's somebody over there. They seem to be loved more than I do. They have friends. Why can't I have friends? They move in the gifts of the Spirit and prophesy. Why doesn't God ever give me anything? See, they, they can even be afraid of God's rejection. And then over on this side, you find suspicion and distrust. I've got to read the expression on their face. Because I've got to know what they're really thinking. See, they may say, good morning. And the person who has a fear of rejection says, hmm, I wonder what they really meant when they said good morning. See, that's suspicion. That's distrust. And that is torment. It's torment to be in that condition. And some of you here tonight have been in that boat. And God wants you out of that boat. So you can free. See, what rejection does, it builds a wall. It keeps you from giving love. It keeps you from receiving love. 
And God wants the flow of reciprocal love between us and Him and us and others. See, this is the healing that's coming in the body of Christ today. We're learning to love one another. We sing love songs and hold hands and hold hands up together. You know, and that's great. Because there's a lot of you that came from families and homes where you were hurt, where you were rejected, and where you didn't have love. Some of you can't remember when your parents ever put their arms about you and hugged you and said, I love you. And that deficiency causes that old rejection wound to build in a person. And one of the things that's happening in the body of Christ is that love. God's church is a family. And we're brothers and sisters. And we are to love one another. And a lot of people need touching love. They need to be touched. And they need to be told that they are loved. Glory to God. That's one of the good things God's doing today. Now... The, the self-rejection is another root spirit. Boy, we're hitting those roots right there. Self-rejection, you know, in schizophrenia or double-mindedness, we deal with uh, multiple personalities. Some people we minister to, we, we find two or three or sometimes even a few more than that demonic personalities in that person other than their tre- true self, their true personality. Now, this is where that thing is rooted. Sometimes we say, say a person's name is Jim. We say, you other Jim personality, you come out of him. And that will represent a whole grouping of spirits that has given him a different personality. Have you known people that had a personality at one time and the next time you saw them they were a different kind of person and you didn't know what they was going to be? You know, you can see a person who's withdrawn and, and who seems to be filled with self-pity and depressed and five minutes later they're coming on like gangbusters, you know. They're just a railing and a anger and everything, a completely different person than that withdrawn, depressed person that you saw five minutes before. Those are not the person's real personality. Those are demonic personalities within that person. And here's where a lot of deliverance takes place. If a person rejects himself, he's opened the door for another personality to come in because that's not going to stay vacant. It's not going to stay void. Many people say, for example, I'm not loved because of the way I am. If I were different, or if I was like so-and-so over there, see, I see their love, so I'll be like them. See, I had to be delivered from false preacher personalities. Adam A. said, why do you always sound like the last preacher you heard preach? Because I was insecure in myself, and I rejected myself. And I said, well, I'm not a good preacher. But if I was like old Bill over there, when he preaches, boy, he really knows how to preach. So I'd get up the next time, and I'd try to preach like Bill. I'd get imitation of Bill. So I took on a Bill personality. See, a lot of people have taken on Copeland's personality and Hagen's personality and Billy Graham's personality. They get up and they sound just like them. Sound just like them. Well, see, that's not their true person. We, we have to be ourselves. You don't have to be anybody else. God made you like He wants you. One of the worst things you can do to yourself is to reject yourself. Some people reject their sex. You know, say if a daddy gets a girl and he wanted a boy... And, and he lets that known, then that girl will try to be like a boy, and she'll learn to catch a ball and catch a fish and do all the other things that boys do, and she takes on masculine characteristics and becomes a tomboy trying to get love and acceptance from her father. These are the activities of demons. Our little eyes are getting opened to some of their deceitful ways and the things that they build up. Now, let's look on through here. We can't go into it on detail, but I want you to see the essence of this. What you begin to see when the devil gets something started, visualize a link in a chain. Now, the devil wants to put another link in that chain. He wants to put as many, forge as many links in a chain as he can. The more links he gets, the more bondage he can put a person in. Look at the little finger over here is another link. There's insecurity and inferiority. I guarantee you, the people that begin to feel rejected begin to feel insecure and inferior. Say, children are in a family where the parents are quarreling, where the parents are fussing and fighting. That child is going to think, what's going to happen to me? Because the child is pushed aside and he becomes insecure. He becomes inferior. The child can become a mother clinger. He can cling to the mother and just be terrified by being taken out of the mother's presence. A mother clinging child is an insecure, has an insecure demon in him, needs to be delivered from. He may suck his thumb. He may attach himself to a little blanket, or he may attach himself to a teddy bear and cling to that. That is the outward sign of that demon of insecurity that's working in the life of that little one. In many ways, people as they grow up then reflect 
the presence of insecurity. Now, on the ring finger, there are the spirits of lust. Now, you know there's different kinds of lust. Material lust. A person can lust for things. A person can lust for recognition. They can lust for power. They can have sexual lust. All of those are different forms of lust. But see, that also is a link to rejection. Because a person who has been rejected is looking for love. And the devil says, I will offer you love. But the way the devil spells love is L-U-S-T. And he offers that as a counterfeit form of love. So a lot of people who are deficient in genuine love between them and other people will turn to material things. And they will become absorbent. They'll be grasping and greedy and covetous of material things. That's a form of lust. But a lot of lust that people are falling into is sexual lust. We don't have to take an inventory here to know that most of us here in this room have fallen victim to some degree to sexual impurity. The devil knows that when we are hungry for love that we may take the temptation bait of lust. A lot of times lust begins in the thought life. It begins with fantasy lust. Just imagining ourselves in a compromising sexual experience. Masturbation is one of the early demons of lust that can get into people. See, masturbation is a form of self-love. It's every bit as common among women as it is among men, and it's demonic. Then the devil doesn't want to stop with that. He wants to push a person on into fornication. And that word embraces all kinds of sexual sins, adultery, bestiality, oral sex, homosexuality. See, all of those are, are just the devil pushing further and further to get a person entrapped in lust, to get them involved in pornography, to try to lead a young woman into a loose moral life, even to the point of becoming a prostitute. All of those things work because the person is looking for love. But those things never do satisfy that love need. I've ministered to thousands upon thousands of people who have fallen into the trap of lust, and not one of them has ever found love satisfaction through going down the avenue of lust. It always leaves condemnation, guilt, confusion, feelings of unworthiness, and worse than that. Now, this finger over here is the pointing finger, and there is the spirit of self-accusation. You know, it was quite some time after God had given this insight that we realized the significance of the fingers. This finger is the tallest. It has the ruler spirit on it. This one over here, the little finger, the diminutive finger, has inferiority. When a person feels inferior, he feels little. So that's the little finger. Here is the ring finger that represents a pure relationship between man and woman or husband and wife, and there are the spirits of lust. This finger is the index finger. That's the one we use to point with. This time it's pointing back this direction. After the devil has tempted someone and they've fallen into sin, the devil says, uh-huh, look what you did. You know, he don't, doesn't take any responsibility at all for the temptation that he brought to you, but he comes to accuse you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he says, look what you did. Do you think God would ever use you? Do you think God could ever bless you? You've committed the unpardonable sin. And we find a lot of Christians today who are under a bondage of condemnation that are just sure that the sin that they committed was so bad that it could never be forgiven. And they're in a hopeless well, and they're wanting to die and all sorts of things. Well, that's what the devil does. He is the one who ministers condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit of God. He didn't come, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him we might be saved. Hallelujah. He came to deliver us. He came to save us. Now, down the hand, all of those spirits represent helper spirits that give assistance to these main spirits that are listed up here on the finger. For example, the fear of judgment. The person who feels rejected and feels that God doesn't love them have a fear of God's judgment. What's God going to do? Like God's got a big stick, you look cross-eyed, and bang, you get it right between the eyes. If you look in 1 John 4 where it says perfect love casts out all fear, and you look at the context of that passage, you know what it's talking about? The fear of God's judgment. 
If you know God loves you, if you're perfected in love, you do not have any fear of God's judgment. All of that fear is cast out. God doesn't want you to be afraid of Him and fear of judgment. Self-pity, that's the old poor me spirit. It says, poor me, nobody loves me, nobody cares what's happened to me. I'm going to go have a pity party and just invite me, myself, and I. I'm going to shut the door, and when we get through, we're just going to feel so terrible. We're just going to eat worms and die. Well, that's old self-pity. If you feel sorry for yourself, that's because the devil has caused you to have a pity party. That's not of God. It never solved a problem. It never met a need. Getting off and feeling sorry for yourself and stewing in your own juice, that doesn't help you a bit. Makes things worse. False compassion, false responsibility. The person who has been rejected is looking for somebody to love. And if you're looking hard enough, the devil will show you somebody to love. He'll point somebody over there that's way down in the mire of sin. He say, why don't you go help him? He knows you're not strong enough at this point to go help him. And he says, you know, you've got to get responsible for that person. There's man after man after man and woman after woman after woman who have gotten involved with those of the opposite sex thinking, well, I'm going to help them because nobody else is going to help them. And you're not able to help them, you're not strong enough to help them, and you get into their pit and you fall into their problem. That's false responsibility and that's false compassion. It's not really of God. By the way, some of that false compassion, there are footnotes on that thing, false compassion can involve an inordinate affection for animals. I should have warned you when I started this thing, there's some hard sayings in this teaching. You know, people, people who are desperate for love and can't get it from people sometimes will resort to their pets to identify, try to get some love. I'll get love out of my puppy dog. See, I can pat him on the head and he'll jump up on me and bark and wag his tail and lick me with his tongue. See, all that means acceptance. And a person who's starved for love, they'll start identifying with animals. Now, to really identify with the animals, they will take on animal spirits. And they'll become like a puppy dog. They'll try to lower themselves to the level of a puppy dog. Sometimes when we cast these inordinate affections for animal spirits out, the demons in that person causes them to act like an animal. They'll act like a dog. They'll bark or they'll lie on their side, you know, and kick, you know, like a dog when you're tickling them in the ribs. Yeah, seen that. Seen them act like horses. They throw their head up and shake their head like a horse shaking his mane, paw the ground and neigh like a horse. Because those persons have been so starved for love that they try to identify with their animals. And they take on animalistic spirits. Or they'll do the opposite of that. They'll try to elevate that animal up to a human level and treat it as, as though it's human. And they'll talk to their kitty cat or their puppy dog and say, I want to tell you my problem. And they'll talk to him, and they'll talk to that person, that dog, like it's a person. My little baby. You precious little baby. You my little baby. And, you know, they'll talk to that thing, they'll put clothes on it, they'll dress it up, and all of that. Folks, that is inordinate affection for animals. And the reason that thing happens and those demons promote those things is because people are desperate and hungry for a love need to be met in their life. You still love me? Okay. All right. Now, the next bunch of spirits you have there, you have depression, despondence, despair, discouragement, hopelessness, suicide, death, death wish, all those goodies. You see, the person who has been rejected and all these problems begin to mount up, he begins to feel so depressed and so discouraged and so hopeless, there is no way out. Now, that's what the devil is trying to get you into. To get you to the point where you wish you were dead. Now, some of you have been there. You've gotten so weary. You've gotten so discouraged. you felt so hopeless that you've said, I wish I were dead. Now, when you say that, you're agreeing with death. And the Word of God says in Mark 11 that we have what we say. That's positive and negative. That's the reason we have to be very careful to guard the words of our mouth. So if you agree with death, you open the door for a spirit of death to come into you, to try to bring premature death to you. Now, when a death spirit comes in, it just colors the personality. It makes a person heavy. It robs them of their joy. They can't maintain joy. They have problems entering into praise. It's just a pall of gloom that will wait over that person, that will death spirits involved there. And then suicide. They'll try to take their own death, a life or they'll plan their own death through taking overdoses of pills, cutting their wrists, shooting themselves with guns, running their automobile into a bridge abutment or whatever. 
The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He wants to destroy every one of us in this room. He's trying to tonight. He wants to destroy you physically. He wants to destroy you mentally. He wants to destroy you emotionally. He wants to destroy you spiritually. That's his purpose. But Jesus comes that we may have life and that we may have it abundantly. Anything that wants to take your life is the opposite of Jesus. Now, the old perfection group down there, that comes about because a person wants to be loved, and he feels, if I can do something so perfect, other people will have to notice me and approve of me. Now, I had that bunch real bad. That old rejection in me made me just push, you know. So I would plan. I was a planner, and I planned everything perfect. I planned my, every day I lived, I planned it to be a perfect day. When I got up in the morning, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Now, over here, you see, the next spirit that comes in is pride, vanity, and ego. When you get to being doing something so better than anybody else, see, pride comes in. They don't even know what to do. They don't even know what they're going to do next. I got mine all planned, see, so pride comes in. But then it doesn't always work out. So there comes intolerance, frustration, and impatience. Impatience with yourself. Impatience and intolerance with anybody that messes up your perfect thing that you're going to do. And on the end of that thing, there can be anger that lashes out. I wish I had time to tell you all about that. All right, here is unfairness. See, that's kind of old self-pity up there. Poor me. Just unfair. You ever hear a little kid say, that's not fair. My brother got more than I did. All right, here's, here's the next group of the spirits. These are what I call spirits of escapism. There's withdrawal, fantasy, daydreaming, unreality, vivid imagination. When a person's world gets so unpleasant because they do not feel loved and accepted that they try to run away in one form or another. Some people think if I leave and run to another part of the country and start life over again, then everything's going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't work out. Because the problem's in the person and not where they're living. Some people escape into fantasy. They escape into daydreaming. They get involved in television, and they get involved in the soap operas, and they escape into those things. They get involved in reading and fiction and things like that, and they escape into that. Some people escape into drugs. Some escape into alcohol. Some people escape into sleep. Just anything to try to get away from the unpleasant world that I'm in. But you can't run away. The only way to solve a problem is to bring it to Jesus. Cast all your care on Him for he careth for you. And the next verse says, Because the devil is a roaring lion, roameth about seeking whom he may devour. The one who doesn't cast his care upon the Lord, the devil is watching for that one because he's not casting his care, he's not trusting in God, and the devil is the roaring lion, he's going to be able to capture him. So we have to learn the alternative to these plots that the devil sets for us. You can't run away. If you try to escape, you just get into deeper bondage. Escape leads to bondage. It doesn't lead to freedom. The only thing that leads to freedom is to have our freedom in Jesus. Now, down here we have other spirits. We have pouting. You know, that's the pooching out of the lips. Self-awareness, timidity, shyness. You know, those are miserable things. See, they, they support this old inferiority and insecurity thing. God doesn't want you to be shy. He wants you to have boldness. Everybody filled with the Holy Ghost is bold. That's what the filling of the Holy Spirit. You read in the book of Acts. Every time they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they did something boldly. And that's what God wants you to do, to move boldly. Not to be timid and shy and withdrawn and all of that. Then here's a spirit of loneliness. You know, a person who has an old spirit of loneliness, he can be in a crowd and still feel lonely. And there's the old spirit of sensitiveness. Sensitiveness. Sensitive to the hurts that other people bring to him. Very easy to get upset. Very easy to cry and all of that sort of thing. That old sensitive. We see that booger many, many times. Now, here's other spirits. Talkativeness, nervousness, tension. Because the person has all these traumas going in his life, he begins to get nervous and tense and fearful. The last one down there is fear. This whole system is shot through with fears. There seems to be a special demon of, of fear for every kind of fear that you can name. Whether it's the fear of the future, or the fear of failure, or the fear of God, or the fear of uh, losing your salvation, or the fear of losing your job, or whatever it is. Fear, fears of bugs, fears of germs, fears of spiders, fears of dogs. You know, fear, fear, fear. Fear of the night, on and on. All this thing shot through with fear. Okay? 
Right on, right quick. If you go clear to the other side over there, and look at the long middle finger here, and there you find the spirit of rebellion. Do you know that rebellion is linked to rejection? It stems out of rejection. Wherever you see someone who is rebellious, you've got to get to the root, and the root is rejection. Eve rebelled against God, disobeyed God, ate the forbidden fruit after the devil got her double-minded about God's love. And she felt, well, if God really loved me, he would let me eat of all of those trees. He'd let me eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But since he said I couldn't, he must not love me, so why should I obey him? You find a child that rebels against the parent, and that child feels that that parent, that may be imaginary rather than real, but that for some reason that child feels that parent doesn't really love me. By the way, you know a lot of children that, are, well, children that have been adopted, that have adopted parents, parents that have adopted children. You know, there's so much frustration that we run into when children have been adopted because the child becomes uh, re feeling rejected and the child later as he grows up becomes rebellious and the parent can't figure out why. Well, it was because that child was rejected before he was born. He was je rejected when he was born a and his parents gave him up. So that introduced the spirit of rejection. And even though that child was loved and that's the reason he was adopted was because those parents wanted somebody to lavish love upon, that child is unable to receive love and later becomes rebellious because of the rejection that was there. Now, look at this linkage from rebellion. See, that's the old spirit of Antichrist. The devil is the original rebeller. By the way, do you know every rebel is a recruiter? You ever notice that? The devil is a recruiter. He rebelled against God, and now he's trying to recruit everybody that he can to come into his ranks. God, uh, God's setting up his army. The devil is setting up his army today, and he's getting his recruits out of the ranks of the rebellious. To rebel against parents, to rebel against any authority, is to fall into the camp of the devil. There's no exceptions to that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry God didn't make an exception for you in your rebellion. If you have fallen into rebellion, a wife against her husband, or anybody against the Lord, or anybody against civil authority or school authority, wherever there is rebellion, there is the work of the devil. The spirit of disobedience that works in the children of disobedience. That's a spirit that's work in those children of disobedience. All right, watch this link up. From rebellion, the next one is self-will. The person who becomes rebe rebellious, then he's denied the authority that God put over his life, and he says, well, I'll be my own authority. He becomes self-will. He becomes independent. Now, he's set up. He's not going to listen to anybody else. Rebellion says, I've cut off authority. I'm not going to listen. I'm my own authority. So the devil tricks him, and he falls into deception. Little finger, he is self-deceived. That's the next linkage. Self-seduction, self-delusion compounds that problem. Now, how is he going to get out of a self-deception? Because he's not going to listen to anybody. And so his friend comes to him, and he says, Look, you're way off in left field. That doctrine that you're, you're following is a false doctrine. Well, bless God, who gave you a right to tell me what I'm to believe? I'm going to make my own decisions. I'll believe whatever doctrine I want to believe. See, so he's painted into the corner. You see under here, the spirits that support that are pride and unteachableness. Now, these spirits over here are compensating spirits for these over here. You know, when the devil gives you one problem, he comes over back and he says, You poor thing, you've got all those problems. Let me help you. In he's sweet. No, he's not. What he means by helping you is to give you another set of problems. In other words, you know, you ever hear of a headache and somebody says, well, let me stomp your toe and that'll get your mind off of your headache. Well, that's, what the, that's the way the devil offers help to us. I'll give you a problem that's so much bigger than the one you've got it'll take your attention off the one you've already got. So here's a par person over here that feels inferior. And the devil says, well, you poor thing, you feel so inferior. You need something to make you feel superior. You need to be filled with pride. You need to have an unteachable spirit. And he offers you something that gets you locked into self-deception. Now, self-deception is believing a lie. Self-deception is thinking that you are right when you are wrong. And if you think you are right, you don't want to change. 
And here is one of the big schemes of the devil against God's church today. You know, the Scripture teaches that in the last days, there's going to be an apostasy. There's going to be a falling away from the faith. Now, how is he going to pull that off? To get people to believe a lie? To get them out from under authority? Where they become their own authority and become self-willed and stubborn and independent? And then draw them into a, a false teaching and a false doctrine and believing a lie? And since they've said, I'm not going to listen to anybody, then they're locked in that deception. And folks, I've found people that are in those deceptions. There are multitudes that are in deception today, and you can't help them. Only by the grace and mercy of God are they going to get out of that. If God loves them enough to hit them between the eyes with a two-before and bring them to their senses, to get them out of that, that's about the only way. If they're not in too far, sometimes we can lovingly persuade them to believe the truth. But that is a major pitfall that the devil is setting. The Scripture says in the last days that there's going to be deceivers. Be not deceived. Let no man deceive you. Deceive not your own self. Doctrines of demons. All of that. That's the plot of the devil against the church in the last days. And we're in trouble if we think that we're so smart that we're going to outfox the devil on our own. All right, watch out for that one. The pointing finger over there points at others. See, this one pointed itself. This one points at others and says, It's your fault. You're to blame for all of my problems. You see on there, there's a little spirit called projection that's on there with the accusation towards others. Now, some of you have run into this thing. You know, somebody accuses you of something. Get that old finger out, you know. I've had people come to me in the past and they say, Brother Frank, you just don't love people. You just don't love the members of your fellowship. And I go search myself and I say, My goodness, I thought I loved everybody. I wonder what gave them that idea. And I'd go introspective. Then they'd come back and they'd point that finger and accuse me of something else. Until I found out that they had a spirit of accusation with projection. What they were doing, they were taking their own problem, which they were unable to see in themselves, and to project it into somebody else. They couldn't see the beam in their own eye, but they could see a moat in somebody else's eye. And that happens a lot of times. When you see that old finger come out accusing you of something you're not guilty of, you can just well mark it down that that person is guilty of the thing that they're accusing you of being guilty of. That's the way that thing works. Now, look quickly down the hand. Here you find judgmentalism. That's old critical fault-finding thing that supports accusation of others. Control and possessiveness. You know, that's a form of witchcraft. Control is. That's just another name for witchcraft. God doesn't want you controlled, and He doesn't want you to control anybody else. Control involves the operation of evil spirits. That's what witches do. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. This is related right under rebellion. Control and possessiveness. Sometimes children are controlled after they're grown and married by their parents. They try to control them and manipulate their lives. God says when a man marries, he leaves his mother and father and cleaves or is glued unto his wife. In other words, he set up a new cell of family government. And his parents are not to interfere in the new government that's been set up by their children. Sometimes husbands are controlled by wives and wives are controlled by husbands. And that's demonic, wherever control is involved. Sometimes pastors control church members. If you don't support this building program that I thought up and give far above your tithes to support of this thing, you're going to have financial disaster. See, that's trying to control a person by threats and fear. If you don't attend every service, if you miss one, you're going to miss the rapture. See, sometimes preachers do that, try to control their congregations, and a lot worse than that. All right, down under here is the root of bitterness. See, that's right under rebellion. You know, uh, when uh, the children of Israel got in the wilderness and they came to that place called Mara, and the water was bitter, and they couldn't drink it, that's, that's what the word Mara means. It literally means bitterness. So the word for bitterness is Mara. Also, the word rebellion, where Saul told Samuel rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, the root word that he used for rebellion is Mara. Because the Hebrews recognized that a rebellious person was an embittered person. That bitterness and rebellion go hand in hand. Now, the devil wants to get that old root of bitterness down into a person. Here are root spirits. They're the devil's three R's. On this hand, this major spirit, these rejection spirits. Over here, rebellion spirits. And down here, the root of bitterness. Or we can call it resentment, which also starts with an R. That's an easy way for you to remember it. Whenever a person is being ministered to for personality problems, 
We must deal with those three root spirits that are linked together just like links in a chain. Rejection causes the person to become rebellious. Rebellious, this causes bitterness to form in the life of that person. So they're linked tightly together. Now, out of that root of bitterness come other rootless. There's resentment, unforgiveness, memory recall, anger, retaliation, over here, hatred, violence, and murder. Now, those things, those things just give strength to that old root of bitterness. Somebody says, well, what is that memory recall thing? Well, that little demon runs around with a tape recorder. And every time he hears somebody say something ugly about you, he puts it on his tape. And so he's got a tape library that goes back for years. And every day he puts it on the tape player and plays all of those tapes from all the things people have said and makes you listen to it in your mind to keep alive all of the hurts that people have done to you down through the years. So that something that was done to hurt you 12 years ago is just as alive in your memory today as it was the day it happened. That is memory recall, and it's a little specialist demon that does that. Now, up between the hands here, you see a hurricane. That means that the person who has all of this demonic activity in his life, his personality is so unsettled that he is a stormy person. He has a stormy personality. Now, there are arrows pointing into this hurricane. Here are a couple of arrows, and they also have hurricanes attached to them. That represents a person who is unstable relating to this unstable person. Now, that's where you have problems, especially if they're trying to live together under the same roof or to try to worship God in the same church fellowship or work together in the same office. They're always clashing. The unstable person encounters the other unstable person and are drawn into their storm. If they get mad, the other person gets mad. Now, I'll put that in the third person so you won't think I'm getting too personal with you. Now, you see a couple of arrows there that have no storms associated with them? That represents a stable person relating to an unstable person, and he doesn't get caught up in the other person's storm. If the other person gets upset, he doesn't get upset. And here's how you can know that you are free. Here's how you can know that you are delivered. This is a real good test for deliverance. Can you be around people who are behaving in a wrong way without getting all stirred up yourself? Without your emotions, without your mind, without your feelings, getting all drawn into that person. Now, if you're going to be a worker for God, if you're going to work in the army of God, if you're going to be a deliverance minister like most of you said you want to be, you have to be stable because you're going to be dealing with a lot of unstable people. And if you are unstable yourself, you're just going to be into one boiling pot after another. So the reason you want to be free and free and stable in your own personality is in order that you can relate to other people without getting drawn into their storms. Now, that little fella down here at the bottom, that little stick figure, now he's the one we've been looking for for over an hour tonight. <clears throat> the real self. Isn't he little? He's skinny. He looks emaciated. He doesn't have any fat on him at all. You know, the only, only good thing I can see about little real self there is he's got a very faint smile. His lips are turned up just a tiny bit there. Now, the reason he can smile a little bit is because he has Jesus in his heart. He's been born again. But the reason he can't smile any bigger than that is because of all this garbage that's over him up here. Now, the reason he's so stunted is because all of that stuff is over him that we've been looking at tonight and pressing down upon him. But he does have potential. You see those arrows? Those arrows go right on out through the top. Now, those arrows represent his ability to grow and to develop in Christ-likeness. So what we're after in the ministry of deliverance is to remove all of the garbage and then through the discipline of body, soul, and spirit to develop this little fellow where he gets some meat on him and he begins to grow. Remember we talked the other day about feeding on the Word and worship and prayer and fellowship and all of those things that are necessary for the real self to begin to develop, the real self to begin to grow and to mature. See, it's not a matter of simply casting out demons, but you've got to fill the house. It's not a matter of just getting rid of those things, but you've got to put the positive thing back in its place. You've got to live a disciplined life. 
body, soul, and spirit. Your mind has to be disciplined. Your emotions have to be disciplined. Your physical body has to be disciplined. Your will has to be disciplined. Your spirit man has to be disciplined. All right? So when these demons are cast out, then the real self can begin to exercise more and he can begin to grow and feed more and he can begin to develop and grow up into the likeness and stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliverance is not something just to make us feel better. Deliverance, we do, we've got to have a higher motive, motivation for deliverance and say, well, I just need to get rid of a certain problem. We need a motivation for deliverance that says, I am going to be like Jesus, and I'm going to live for the Lord, and I'm going to serve Him, and I'm going to glorify Him in my body and in my spirit, which are His. That must be our motivation. If that's not your motivation, then you do not have high enough a motivation to get free and to stay free. You've got to have an intense hunger in your heart to be totally devoted to the Lord and serve Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what it takes. Now, sometimes we get to that point and people tell me, well, Brother Frank, you sure did say a lot of things that sounded like me. How many honest people we have here tonight? Okay. <laughs> we'll have to cast out that lying spirit first. <laughs> now, the reason, the reason most of you identify with good portions of that is because it's a master plan of the devil. I've been delivered from most of the things on that chart up there. And Ida May has, and most of the people we minister to, we minister to them basically with these root things we see here. Now, let me warn you, as you go out and take this, this is not only to help you remember, but it's to help you minister to others. As you go out to minister, don't try to follow this slavishly. Some people get my book, and I've got a listing of demon groupings in there, and they come up and they think I'm going to be so pleased. They say, Brother Frank, you know, I was ministering delivers to somebody, and I just took your list, and you got in your book, and I just went down it and checked every one of them off, you know, and called for every one of them. I said, shame on you. Shame on you. Somebody says, I took that schizophrenia chart and I just went down it and called out every demon on that chart. I said, don't you dare. Because when we minister deliverance, we have to follow the Holy Spirit. Now, we're looking at a master plan. It's going to help us to know, to be on the alert and to watch out for these things. But if you follow any method slavishly, you're going to miss some of the key things that need to be dealt with in people that you minister to. So there are other things besides that are on here. Besides that, this woman, she had in, in that chart there, she had uh, an accent upon hatred and resentment. She just, you know, she just, when she got upset with somebody, she just couldn't forgive them. And I'd tell her time after time after time, look, all you need to do is forgive when you get hurt. I bet I told her that at least a hundred times. One day she was listening to a Ken Copeland tape, and she came to me so excited, and she said, Brother Frank, I was listening to a tape by Ken Copeland, and he said, if somebody hurts you, what you need to do is forgive them. And glory to God. Hallelujah. Finally soaked through. Finally got through. But see, another person, the accent of their problem may not fall on hatred. It may fall on fear, or it may fall on lust, or it may fall on rejection, or it may fall on anger. That will help you to identify the ruler spirit where that major area is. If a person has a major area with hatred and they hate people and they, they hate housework and they hate church and they hate everything comes along, well, you might as well draw it down that that's a rare area where there's an old major spirit, an old ruler spirit of hatred that's at work in that person's life. So you go after those root spirits that God is identifying in your own life where that accent falls and where that old tenacious problem been troubling you and been bugging you, and we'll be free of it tonight. But some people see that and say, well, I identify with that, but I don't think after that I want deliverance. I say, wait a minute, you said you identified with that and that you saw that demons caused that problem, and, and yet you don't want to go through with deliverance? Why not? Well, now, Brother Frank, you just don't understand. Now, you, you said all those things were caused by demons and their activities, and I always thought that was just me. Now, if you cast all of that out, what's going to be left? <laughs> Fist you and Jesus. That's all. Fist you and Jesus. You'll like what's left. You may have to start from scratch, but you're going to like what's left. Hallelujah. You know, actually, we've carried people 
through so much personality deliverance that after it was over with, they didn't know who they were for a few days. Because that things happened that used to get them upset, and that same thing would happen, and they didn't get upset again, and they said, hey, that really wasn't me. What am I really like? And so they go through a wonderful exploration of discovering who their real self is and learn about that Jesus nature that's within them. Now, we need to believe God. We've, we've got all that teaching to lay a good groundwork. I know when I teach this thing that those devils get excited. They know, uh-oh, I've been found out. Boy, I can't hide any longer. So they're at fever pitch, and they're ready to get out of you. Some of you have had a lot of deliverance, but some of you still going to get some more tonight. Hallelujah. Now, how much deliverance you get depends on how much you put into it. Don't leave it all up to me and the ones that will be working as counselors around the room. But you determine that you are going to fight. Satan, I see what you've been doing to me, and I'm not going to let you get by. I'm not going to let you make my life miserable. I'm not going to let you defeat me. I'm not going to let you destroy me. Satan, I dig my feet in, and I stand against you, and I take authority over you, and you're going to fall, and I'm going to stand, because Jesus said I could stand in His might and in the power of His strength. And I'm standing against you. This is no time to be passive. This is no time. God said in prophecy tonight, He said it's no time to be timid, but it's a time to press in. Did you hear that? No time to be timid. No time to be shy. But to press on in and to get your victory. And you can have as much deliverance tonight as you want, as much deliverance as you need, as you yourself stand against the power of the devil. You know what he's been doing to you. You see the things that you have identified with, even in this revelation tonight. You stand against every one of those things and challenge every one of them, command them to go, take a deep breath and breathe that thing out, and it will come out in the name of Jesus. Now, there's one big hindrance to deliverance. There's several things that will hinder or block deliverance, but there's one that is predominant, and we've got to deal with that thing first. That is that matter of unforgiveness. According to Matthew 18... If anyone has trespassed against you or hurt you any way at any time in your life and you haven't forgiven them, then God says He will turn you over to the tormentors until you do. He'll turn you over to evil spirits and you'll be tormented by evil spirits because if you expect God to forgive you, He expects you to forgive others. He taught us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I want to lead you in a prayer in a moment where you will forgive all others who ever hurt you in any way. That's what God requires as a condition for you to be set free. Now, when we call spirits out, some people have manifestations that are noticeable. We're not here to be uh, involved in just looking at manifestations. We're here to be set free. Manifestations is just one of those things that happen sometimes when people get deliverance. Sometimes... Most of the manifestations will come through the breath because breath and spirit are the same in the Word of God. So spirits are as breath, and they will come out as a yawn, as a burp, as a sigh, as a cough. And with the coughing, there may be phlegm or mucus or foam that's brought up. Sometimes the spirits cry in a loud voice. We don't have near as much of that as we used to as we grow in faith and as the devil knows that we don't accept those kind of things. If anybody you ever minister to, the demons try to take them over, as we say, and control their bodies and control their speech, you tell that person, you resist that demon. You don't have to let him control you that way. You command him to go. You start breathing him out. And those spirits will come out just like that without all of that struggle, without all that fighting that so often takes place. Sometimes during deliverance, people feel sensation in their hands. How many of you during deliverance this week have had hand sensations? Right. So you feel it may be a tingling, or, or sometimes the hand actually begins strutted and the fingers turn in, things like that. Those are demon manifestations. Sometimes people feel sensations in their face, like their face is drawn and their mouth is drawn. and It's difficult for them to talk and their mouth is puckered up. Some people feel sudden pains in their head or their back or other parts of their body. Don't pay any attention to those uh, manifestations. Don't get sidetracked. Just press through. Keep commanding that spirit. Keep renouncing that spirit. 
Keep concentrating on your warfare. Those manifestations will all subside and they'll all go away. But the thing that we're after is to get that evil spirit out. So a lot of you are about to get some relief that you've wanted and some that you've needed for a long time. Let's stand and let's go through a deliverance prayer. Praise the Lord. Jesus. They said we didn't have breakfast till 9 in the morning? Oh, 8, between 8 and 9. Well, that gives us an extra hour to minister then, doesn't it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to need it, I think. Praise you. I want you to be relaxed. Now, dealing with devils and casting out evil spirits is serious business. But that doesn't mean that we have to be uptight because we know our authority and we know our power over evil spirits. But what we're doing tonight is going to be something that's going to have benefits in your life and solve needs in your life that you've needed and wanted for a long time. So give it your best. As we call upon the Lord, we've asked the Lord to give us a mighty anointing for deliverance tonight. So keep attention. Don't allow the devil to cause you to become indifferent and fail to participate. I pray to God that each one of you in this service tonight will be a participator and not a spectator. That you're not here just to look around and see what happens to somebody else, but that you are here knowing that you yourself need to be free as you can. Cooperate. Every demon I call, assume that you've got at least one of that kind. And I'll make you a promise. If he's not in you, he won't come out. But if he is in you, as you've met God's conditions, he must leave in the name of Jesus. Some of you will not have perceptible manifestations. The only manifestation you will have will be that of your own will as you take a breath to breathe those spirits out. The degree of manifestation does not determine the degree of deliverance. You can be as free as somebody that's thrown in the floor by the power of the demons if all you do is just breathe that spirit out. So you follow the instructions. Now, some of you get zealous and you want to just breathe all over the place. Don't breathe so much you hyperventilate. Don't be anemic and just give a little faint. But, you know, breathe out with authority as though you're squeezing every trace of air you can out of your lungs. And when you do that, that spirit that we've commanded to come out because it moves into your breath apparatus to come out, you will be helping to push it out. Derek Prince says that's what I call expelling demons, where a person takes their own breath and they expel it. And when you do that, other things may happen. You may yawn or you may cough or burp or something else. If you burp during deliverance, we don't say excuse me. We just say praise the Lord and go right on. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Lord. All right, I want you to say this prayer with me. Now, mean it from all of your heart. Say it from deep inside. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. you are the Son of the living God. You died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again from the dead. You died to take my sin burden. Lord, I confess my sins. And I repent of all of my sins. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. I accept your forgiveness. <clears throat> and I forgive myself. <clears throat> and as you forgive me, I forgive all others. I forgive each person who has hurt me in any way. <clears throat> I want to pause there just a minute and give you an opportunity to personalize that. This is so important. <clears throat> you let the Lord show you any particular ones who have hurt you, offended you, rejected you, abused you. I don't care how many times they hurt you or how hard they hurt you. It's imperative that as an act of your will, a decision on your part that you decide to forgive them tonight. You don't have to talk out loud, but just privately between you and the Lord, be sure that you have forgiven each person that you need to forgive. 
Lord, you just call to our remembrance those that we need to forgive. If it's a parent, if it's a brother or sister, a neighbor, another relative, somebody at work, somebody in the church, a pastor, a fellow church member, whoever it's been, Lord, we just forgive each one of them tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's go ahead with our prayer. <laughs> Lord, I have forgiven these. And I ask you to forgive them. I even bless them in your name. And by your love, I love them. Now, Lord, you've said in your word that whoever calls on your name shall be delivered. I call upon you now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver me and set me free. Satan, I renounce you. I do not want you in my life. I'm through with you. I take back from you all ground I ever yielded to you. And I command you to leave me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I bind you principalities, and together as the army of God, we take authority over you. And every spirit that has been sent to bind and confuse and harass and defeat each one of us here, you ruler spirits are bound. The strong man is bound tonight, and we come to spoil his house. Satan, you cannot do harm to any one of us. We are under the covering and protection of the blood and what it has done for us and what it means to us. And we have authority over you in Jesus' name. And he said that we could tread upon you as upon serpents and scorpions, and you could in no wise hurt us. We have no fear of you. You will not hurt us. You will not hurt anyone around us. You will not hurt any of our relatives. You will not hurt any of our possessions or anything that pertains to our life. We are safe in the keeping of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have power and dominion over you. And you are a defeated foe. And you are leaving our lives right now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask you just to be seated quietly again. And uh, let's try to keep down as much noise and distraction as we can during the service so you can hear continued instructions from me here. But we're going to lay the axe to some of these roots. Since that old thing of unforgiveness and bitterness... It's a key thing to get out of the way. Let's get rid of that root of bitterness. Let's renounce it together. And then as we move on into deliverance, I'll not stop to have you renounce each thing individually. You can do this on your own. As I call for a new spirit or a new grouping of spirits, you just you don't have to speak out real loud. It's better if you don't. But just speak out and say, I renounce you and I command you to leave me and take a breath. And let's do that together in unity all the way through this time of deliverance tonight. Now, those who are working as counselors, and I've asked Brother Glenn if we have extras to help tonight, to have some extra counselors helping tonight, because we want you to get as much deliverance as is possible for you to get tonight. So you enter in, and you counselors help. Counselors, if God gives you discernment as you minister individually, you follow that discernment. Don't stay bound to what I'm doing here. Don't become a slave to that. Let's follow the leadership of God's Holy Spirit. Many times in group deliverances, the Lord will give me discernment of things that I need to deal with, even some things that I've never dealt with before. So I'll try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit tonight and follow Him to deal with the things that God's Spirit knows needs to be dealt with. But He's saying tonight, let's start with that old root of bitterness from those hurts, from those wounds that you have experienced way back, sometimes even before you were born. Things that you were not responsible for. Your parents didn't protect you. They didn't know how to protect you. They didn't care about protecting you. They weren't believers that couldn't protect you. We're going to get rid of a backlog of hurts, of bitternesses, of resentments. In the name of Jesus, say this with me. In the name of Jesus, I stand against the root of bitterness and all its helpers. I command you. In the name of Jesus, go. Now just take a deep breath. In the name of Jesus, the spirits of bitterness, 
The spirits of resentment, I command you to go. The spirit of hatred, resentment and hatred of parents because of their rejections, because of their hurts, because of their abuses. I command every spirit of resentment and hatred of parents, I command it to go in the name of Jesus. I command every spirit of root of bitterness and your helpers, that bitterness against any relative, I command you to go. Against any neighbor, I command you to go. For whatever person, I command you to go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. Resentment, bitterness, hatred. I command each one of you to leave tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we stand against you. If you need help, you know that this has been a major problem. You need help. Have one of the counselors. Just motion for one of these in the aisle. Just lift up your hand and tell them to come in and help you. That's why they're there. That's why they're there. In the name of Jesus, some of you have been deeply hurt. You've been deeply hurt. You've been deeply offended. And you've carried resentments and bitternesses. Those old resentments and bitternesses cause problems in your physical body. They can cause arthritis and they can cause nervous upset and they can cause ulcers in your stomach. In the name of Jesus, we command all of you bitterness with all of your problems. We command you to go. You get out of our emotions. Get out of our emotions. Release our emotions. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, memory recall, retaliation, violence, murder. Every one of you, we command you, go now. Go now. Go now. Bitterness. Bitterness. I see bitterness towards school teachers. Bitterness towards school teachers. In the name of Jesus, I command it to go because that teacher was unfair and was cruel and was hard and was unloving. I command to go in the name of Jesus. I command to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I see bitterness towards a father because he was an alcoholic and he didn't spend time at home and he squandered all the money and the family didn't have enough and you didn't have enough clothes. You didn't have enough food, and you were deprived. And so you built resentment towards that father. In the name of Jesus, I command you, you go now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus is against you, enemy. We are free from that resentment. We are free to love everybody. Every one of you spirits of resentment that keep us from forgiving, we do forgive. You spirit of unforgiveness, you tell us we can't forgive. You're a liar, devil. You tell us we don't have to forgive. You're a liar, devil. And we command you to go in the name of Jesus. We command you to go in the name of Jesus. Go now in the power of Jesus' name. In the power of Jesus' name. You continue to leave. Continue to leave. Continue to go. Right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All of those hurts, those hurts that came in through marital conflicts, I command those resentment and bitterness spirits I command them to go. All the spirits that have come in through the strife and the arguments and the debate and the confusion and the conflict between husband and wife, I command you to go. All of you that have resulted in separation, resulted in divorce or talk about divorce, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. I command you to go. Spirits of hurt. Spirits of hurt. Spirits of hurt. Spirits of disappointment. Spirits of heartache heartache and heartbreak spirits. I command you to go. You leave us tonight in the name of Jesus. Good. Keep pressing them. Keep pressing them, folks. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everyone, spirits of heartache, heartache, disappointment, disappointment. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. That's right. All of you are crying spirits, crying spirits. In the name of Jesus, just cried and cried and cried. Misery. Misery, misery and heartache in the name of the Lord. That's right, devils. Keep coming out. Keep coming out in the name of Jesus. Keep coming out in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you, enemy. Hallelujah. He's atoned for our sins by His precious blood. He's redeemed us and cleansed us and justified us. And we belong to Him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You continue to go by the power of Jesus' name. You continue to go in the power of the blood of Jesus. That's right. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we've released that bitterness. 
We've released that unforgiveness. We've released those hurts in the name of Jesus. Lord, just come in and heal and bring your healing balm into our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Our bodies are the temples of God's Holy Spirit. Your Spirit dwells within us. And we've been redeemed by His precious blood. By Your stripes we're healed. We're set free from the oppression of the enemy. Command all of you to leave us tonight in Jesus' name. Let's go on to rejection. Remember, rejection is a root. Rejection is a root. It's something that Satan has tried to bring into each one of our lives. We go back to prenatal rejection. Rejection from before birth. And I command you to go in Jesus' name. Prenatal rejection. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Prenatal rejection. You leave us tonight. Because we were not wanted before birth. We were not wanted by mother or father before we were born. We were rejected from the time our conception was known. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you spirits of rejection. I command you to leave us now. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out in the name of Jesus. Rejection. Parental rejection. Parental rejection. I command you to go. My mother never loved me. My father never loved me. They didn't have time for me. They didn't have time for me. They were too busy. They pushed me aside. I command every one of you to go in Jesus' name. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now. Go quickly in the name of Jesus. Every spirit, every spirit of parental rejection, I command you to leave. You leave and you go out. We cast you out. We cast you out, devils, in the name of Jesus. We cast you out in the name of Jesus. That's right. Prenatal rejection, parental rejection, father rejection, father rejection. Spirits, I command you to go. Father rejection. Mother rejection. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Some of you were re felt rejected when a younger brother or sister was born. When a younger sister or brother was born and they got the attention and you didn't get the attention anymore. I command that spirit of rejection to go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you were left. You, you were... You were given up by your parents. They didn't even want you. Your blood parents gave you up. You were adopted or something else happened to you. And I command those spirits of rejection to go. Rejection. You must go where the parents gave them up. Some of you suffered rejection in the hospital when you were taken away from your mother. Some of you as little children were put in a hospital for treatment and taken away from your parents. And there was loneliness and there was hurt. And there was rejection. And there was insecurity. I command the insecurity to go too in the name of Jesus. Spirits of insecurity. Insecurity. I command you to leave us tonight. Go now. In Jesus' name. <coughs> Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Self-rejection. Fear of rejection in all your paranoid helpers. I command you to go. Fear of rejection and jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy, suspicion, distrust, fears of persecution, confrontation. I command every one of you to go. All of you fear of rejection and paranoid spirit. I command you to leave us tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Keep going, keep going, keep going. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Self-rejection. 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 Rejecting your appearance. Rejecting your name. Rejecting your sex. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Every spirit of self-rejection. Self-rejection. Self-hatred. 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 We command you to leave us tonight. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord, every spirit of self-hatred, self-hatred, self-rejection, keep going. Keep going now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Now we're going to deal with those spirits of lust. Spirits of lust, material lust, sexual lust, every kind of over-desire. You spirits of, you're not going to lie to us. You're not going to deceive us. You're not going to defile us. In the name of Jesus, I command the spirits of lust, materialism, materialism, and lust for things, and lust for things. We command you to go. Go now in Jesus' name. Go now in Jesus' name. That's right. Keep coming out. Keep coming out. You must go. You must go in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of lust, spirits of want, I want this, and I want that, and I want the other thing. Not satisfied. Spirits of dissatisfaction. Your companion to material lust. Dissatisfaction. I command you to go. In Jesus' name. Come on out, you old spirits of material lust. You spirits of sexual lust. Fantasy lust. Fantasy lust. Masturbation. Fornication. Adultery. Pornography. Harlotry. Homosexuality. Lesbianism. Oral sex. All you perverse devils, come on out. Every spirit of rape, molestation, and incest. Some of you were victims of those things. Those caused very serious personality wounds. If you were ever molested, if you were ever molested, a victim of incest or rape, and about one out of every four you women were, in the name of Jesus, we command you spirits to come out. You spirits of abuse. You spirits of sexual abuse, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, sexual abuse. Come on out. Vil vil molestation, incest, rape, I command you, go now in Jesus' name. Go now in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. You can't stay. We don't want you. We don't want you in the name of Jesus. We cleanse our memories. Our minds are cleared. Our speech is cleared. Our physical body is cleared in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of lust, lust for recognition, lust for power, lust for money, and things money can buy, we command you to loose us and go tonight. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Spirits of condemnation. You spirits of condemnation, I call you out now. Guilt, you old root of guilt, condemnation, unworthiness that make us feel that we've committed a sin that can't be forgiven. You old devil that keeps alive condemnation and guilt. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are covered by the forgiving power of God, by His grace and by His love. I command you spirits of guilt, you spirits of shame, Spirits of embarrassment, spirits of fear of being found out, fear of being exposed for the things that I've done. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that's right, all of you must leave tonight. All of you must leave tonight. Guilt. Oh, this is so important. God has forgiven us. There's no condemnation now to those who are in Christ Jesus. We're walking not after the flesh, but after the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord that you've taken the stain of sin. You've removed our transgression as far as the east is from the west. You've canceled our sin debt and nailed it to the cross. You remember our sins no more. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. We'll not face those sins in the day of judgment because you've reckoned with them through Christ. And they've been removed. And the stain of sin is gone. The reproach of sin and guilt of sin is removed. We're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're clothed in His righteousness, devil. Hallelujah. You don't like that. You don't like that, that we're clothed and we're forgiven. But I remind you of it, devil. I remind you, every one of us, I don't care what we've done, we are forgiven and we're cleansed tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Keep coming out. Keep coming out in the name of Jesus. Now let's deal with depression, depression and despondency. Many of you have been depressed. Many of you felt hopeless. Many of you faced walls of despair. You couldn't find a way. In the name of Jesus, we stand against you spirits of depression, despondency, despair, defeat, 
discouragement, hopelessness, death wish, and suicide. I command every one of you to go from us now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out. Leave now in the name of Jesus. Leave now. You must go. You must go. You must go. Depression. Your spirit of heaviness. We put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Command every spirit of heaviness to go. In the name of Jesus. Heaviness. Heaviness. Depression. Despondency. Despair. Come on out in the name of Jesus. Come on out in the name of Jesus. All depression, despondency, gloom, and heaviness. We command you to leave us tonight in the name of Jesus. Leave now in the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. You must go. You must go. You can't hang on us, devils. You can't put that yoke of oppression on us. In the name of Jesus, you're not going to rob us of joy. You're not going to rob us of peace. You're not going to hinder our praise. You'll hinder us to praise. You old depression spirit. You old heavenly spirit. I command you. I command you to come out of our lungs. Come out of our lungs. He that hath breath will praise the Lord. And we'll have breath to praise the Lord. Every one of you, spirits of heaviness and depression, come out of our lungs and release us tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Keep coming out. Keep coming out now. In Jesus' precious name. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Coria paramana casilla la baleato. Coria paramana castalla la baracasa. Coroba, caramana casilla la banaca. In the name of Jesus, come on out. Come on out now in the name of Jesus, you demon. Every one of you. Every one of you. The Spirit won't let me go on. There's still more depression that's got to go. More despondence. There's more spirits of death. Death and death wish. I command you to go. I command you to go. Spirits of death. Spirits of death wish. We cast you out tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Devils, you will not make us passive. You will not make us indifferent. You will not make us self-conscious. But we stand against you. We've waited too long for this night. You're not going to block the way. Block the way. There are spirits of suppression that some of you have because you've had a tendency to suppress your problems. And you push it down on the inside. You try to smile on the outside and look like to everybody else, well, I'm all right. But you just pushed it down and you're hurting on the inside. Those are spirits of suppression. And I command those suppression spirits to go. In the name of Jesus, suppression from all those suppressed fears and suppressed hurts. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go, you spirit of this, uh, suppression. Suppression, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Come on out of us. Come on out of us, spirits of suppression. Spirits of suppression, you must leave us tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, spirits of suppression, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Go now in Jesus' name. You leave us. You can't stay around any longer. No longer. In the name of Jesus, we defeat you, your defeated foes. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Coria paramana casalla la paniato. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All of you spirits of fear, I stand against you now in the name of Jesus. Myriads of fears. Come on out, spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. Fear of man. Fear of man, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. That's right. Come on out. Come on out now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. Just cough him out. Just cough him out. That's right. Spirit of fear. That's right. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, fear, fear of man. God's Word says that fear of man bringeth a snare, but I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We defeat you with the Word of God, which is the sword of God's Spirit. Fear of the future. The Lord told us not to be anxious about tomorrow. 
Not to be anxious about what we'd wear. Not to be anxious about what we would eat. All right, all of you fears, you old phobia fears, acrophobia, acrophobia, fear of high places, claustrophobia, fear of closed in places. Come on out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. All you unnatural phobia fears, fears of bugs and spiders and germs, fear of germs, fear of uncleanness, <laughs> fear of sickness. Fear of sickness, fear of surgery, fear of death, fear of doctors, fear of hospitals. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Fear of the dark, fear of the dark, fear of failure, fear of not pleasing God, fear of not pleasing God, fear of not pleasing man. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, fear of accident, fear of flying in airplanes, fear of driving cars. In the name of Jesus. Fears. Some of you were in car accidents. It's given you a fear. Fear of drowning. Fear of water. Come on out. All of you old fears of hurt. Fears of accident. And fear of death. I command every one of you. You leave tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. All fears. All fears. Religious fears. All religious fears. Fears of God. Fears of God. Fears of having committed the unpardonable sin. Fears of God's rejection. Fears of God's judgment. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Keep coming out. Every kind of fear. You must go tonight in the name of Jesus. You must go tonight in the name of Jesus. Every demon of fear, I command you to leave us. Right now, the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Self-pity. Self-pity and all your helpers must go. We cast you out in the name of Jesus. Self-pity and all your helpers, we cast you out in the name of Jesus. Come on out, self-pity. Unfairness. Unfairness. Go now. Go now. You'll leave in the power of Jesus' name. You'll leave now. That's right, in Jesus' name. All of you self-spirits, self-awareness, self-consciousness, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Come on out, all spirits of self-consciousness, self-awareness, timidity, shyness, you leave us now. Go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. Come on out, all you self-centered spirits, Spirits of pride, self-importance, self-importance, self-sufficiency, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> All of you come out now, in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of pride, self-importance, independence. <laughs> Arrogance. Come on out, in the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out. Self-deception. Self-deception. Self-delusion. Self-seduction. Unteachableness. Unteachableness. Pride. Pride. All of you all independent devils, go in the name of Jesus. You keep us separated from the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus. The Lord just gave me discernment on the Spirit that we'll call correction, rejection. It's, it's that kind of that old sensitive spirit that, that when you need correction and those over you, whether it's a husband over a wife or parents over a children or a pastor over a person, tries to correct that person, they receive that correction as though it were rejection. They can't see it as just something I need to correct me but you feel hurt, you feel sensitive, you feel wounded. It's correction, rejection. Correction, rejection. And I command you to go in Jesus' name. Unable to receive correction. Feeling that when I'm corrected, I'm not loved, I'm not appreciated. I'm put down. Why do they always put me down? In the name of Jesus. 
Correction, rejection, I command you to go. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit of rebellion. Let's get him and all his helpers. Rebellion, defiance, disobedience, stubbornness, self-will, selfishness. I command you and all your helpers, you gang of spirits, that you go in Jesus' name. Rebellion. Rebellion. You spirit of Antichrist. You're an Antichrist spirit. You're opposed to Christ. You're opposed to God. You're the spirit of this world. You're the spirit of the God of this world. You old rebel spirit. You old rebel recruiting spirit in the name of Jesus. Tries to draw everybody else around you into rebellion. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Parental rebellion. Rebellion against parents. Rebellion against parents. Rebellion against civil authority. Rebellion against spiritual authority. I command every spirit of rebellion, defiance, stubbornness, self-will, independence, selfishness. I command every one of you, go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You are spirits of criticism. Criticism, you critical spirit. Now, a lot of you know you've had that old critical spirit. You're just so quick to judge other people, to give an opinion about everybody else. Just remember, you're not responsible to judge anybody unless you have authority over them. That really eliminates a lot of your work. In the name of Jesus, all spirits of criticism, all spirits of judgmentalism, all spirits of accusation of others, all spirit of projection accusation, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come on out of us. Come on out of us. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now. Keep going. In the name of Jesus. Enemy, you are overcome. We're going to live for the Lord. We're sanctified. We're cleansed. We're set apart as chosen vessels of the Lord and set apart for the Master's use. Everything that defiles. The temple is cleansed, just like Jesus cleansed the temple. And He drove out every defiling thing out of the outer court. Devil, you're that defiling thing, and our body is the temple of God's Spirit. And you're leaving tonight. You're leaving tonight. Our temple is for the glory of God, and we're going to serve God. We're going to glorify God in these bodies. We're through with you devils. All of you old vexing, tormenting spirits. All of you spirits of mental oppression, I command you to come out. Mental oppression spirits, I stand against you now. In Jesus' name. Mental oppression, mind-binding spirits. Mental illness, mental insanity. Fear of insanity. Fear of mental breakdown. In the name of Jesus, mind-binding. Mind-binding, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out, all of you old mental oppressing spirits. Mental torment, mental anxiety, mental anguish. I command you to go. I command you to go. Turmoil of mind. Where the mind just churns and turns and thinks and thinks and thinks. And the mind is never quiet. The mind is not at peace. I command it to go. In the name of Jesus. You old spirits of mental stupor. Mental stupor, mental tranquilization. You old devils that have come in through drugs. You've come in through things of tranquilizers and things that stupefied and dull the mind. I command you to go. I command you to go. You old drug-induced spirit that's affected the mind. All of you spirits, hallucinogenic drugs, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, barbiturate drugs, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Valium and all your clan, I command you to go. Thorazine and all your clan, I command you to go. You release our minds. You release our minds. We're not captive of you anymore. All you spirits of drugs, you pharmacia spirits, get out. You sorcery devils, sorcery of drugs, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. 
In the name of Jesus. All of you old painkiller drugs, I command you to go. Dimrol and all the rest of you, Tylenol, all of you. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now in the name of Jesus. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. The rest of you mental oppression spirits, all mental, mind-binding, mind-oppressing, forgetfulness, forgetfulness, I command you to go. Hindrance to learning. Hindrance to learning, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hindrance to learning. I command you to go in Jesus' name. All spirits of mental retardation, mental retardation and slow learning spirits, you leave us tonight, you devils that have bound our minds and harassed our minds, spirits of brain damage, brain damage, I command you to go. Brain damage in the name of go to go. There are spirits that have come in through surgery, surgery related spirits. Every one of you that's been through surgery have picked up demons through anesthetics, through anesthetics and drugs and having been cut open in the name of Jesus and trauma and shock and death. I command you, all of you surgery related spirits, I command you to go. Surgery spirits, surgery spirits, I command you to go in the name of the Lord Jesus. You go now in Jesus' name. You leave us tonight. The blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. All of you birthing spirits, birth trauma, birth trauma spirits, birth trauma spirits, I command you to go. Birth trauma, birth trauma. And the card was wrapped. Macomium in the birth, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, almost died. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, all birth trauma, birth shock spirits, I command to go. All spirits that entered through birthing, I command to leave in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. If you know of anything that I haven't called, don't wait for me to call it. You rebuke it. You renounce it, minister deliverance to yourself. You can have all the deliverance you need tonight. You can have all the deliverance you need tonight. If you'll just stay in the battle, keep rebuking those spirits. You know what's troubled you. You know what's hindered you. You old demons of spiritual hindrance, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Spiritual hindrance, spiritual blockage spirits, I command you to go. That's right. None of you old occult spirits are going to hang around. Command all of you to leave tonight in the name of Jesus. All occultism has to go in the name of Jesus. Now, some of you have lived too much in unreality. You've lived in fantasy and make-believe, and you've escaped. Some of you have tried a lot of escape tricks. Let's close the door on all of that escape. In the name of Jesus... We command every spirit of escapism, spirits of fantasy, spirits of unreality, you old fiv spirits of vivid imagination, escape through reading, escape through television, escape through drugs, escape through alcohol, escape through sleep, in the name of Jesus, escape through running. You running spirits, makes us want to run away, makes us run away. In the name of Jesus, some of you have run away. Some of you have almost run away. In the name of Jesus. Spirits of escapism. 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 In the name of Jesus. Some of you escape through sleep. You just don't get out of bed. You just won't get out of bed. In the name of Jesus. As long as I'm asleep, I can't think about responsibility. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. I command you to go right now. Go now. In Jesus' name. Now all of you false love spirits, false love, false compassion, false responsibility, I command you to go in Jesus' name. False love, false love, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus.
This is more of those old perverse spirits. Perverseness, homosexuality, lesbianism, and fear of those things. Maybe you've never practiced it, but it's been in your mind. Jesus says, you know, that if we look on a woman to lust after her, we've committed adultery already in our heart. It can be in your heart, and the demon can come in because that thing's been in your heart. Not necessarily because you have done an overt act of sin there. I command you spirits of homosexuality and lesbianism and sexual perverseness. I command every one of you to leave now and go now with all your helpers. Now, you demons of false personality, you demons of the confusion of personality that keep people from knowing who they really are, I command you to leave. You other self, you false self spirit, you false identity spirit, you false counterfeit personality spirit, I command you to leave us tonight in Jesus' name. You're rooted in self-rejection. You're rooted in self-rejection, and I command you to leave us tonight. Go now. Go now in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus, we just worship you. We take time to praise you and give thanks unto you, Lord for your faithfulness and for your goodness. Lord, your word is true, and not one word that you have spoken ever falls to the ground. No one who puts their hope and their faith and trust in thee shall ever be put to shame. We shall never be put down, Lord. We shall never be disappointed because of our relationship with you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. We give thanks unto you. We give glory unto your name, Lord. Hallelujah! We magnify the name of Jesus. We magnify the name of Jesus. Glory to God. 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 Saints, it's good to give to God the glory and give God the praise and the thanksgiving. You know... Sometimes it takes a little while for things to dawn on us. Sometimes it takes a little while for us to know what the Lord has really accomplished. Let me just share a testimony or two to encourage your heart in knowing what God's done. We, we had a meeting like this. It was down in the city of Dallas several years ago. And we had about 500 people in a group deliverance down there. And a few months later, I received a phone call from a man... He said, Brother Frank, I want you to know that I was in that meeting and I had been under psychiatric care for 16 years. Well, that represents a lot of years and a lot of dollars. He had been continually under psychiatric treatment for 16 years. He said, I received more in one hour of group deliverance than I did in 16 years of psychiatric health. And it didn't cost him anything. The Lord paid a big price for it, but it didn't cost him. Not long ago, just a few months ago, I was ministering down in Central Texas. And a lady came to me. She was the wife of the elder in the church where I was ministering. She said, Brother Frank, you probably don't remember me. But seven years ago, I came up to your church. And your church was having a deliverance conference. And I had mental illness. I'd had shock treatments. I was on drugs for mental illness and had suffered from it for years and said, you folks got discernment that there was a curse of mental illness that had come down through my family. And you broke that curse off of me that day. And said, I went back home totally healed. And said, I've been healed from mental illness all those seven years. And you know, we were in her home, and we had a meal in her home, and were with them for several days, and it was obvious that she had no more problem with mental illness. When we ministered in Denmark in 79... There was a man there that was mentally ill. He'd been mentally ill for ten years. And he was set free. Later he wrote us and said that he was set free. He hadn't been able to work, hadn't been able to function, be a husband or a father to his family. But after that deliverance, he was set free. I wish you could read the letters that we get of people that write us. And when we go back to places where we've ministered, of the testimony that people give and say, Glory to God. It may take a little while for some of you to realize what God has done for you. But don't ever forget to give God the glory and to give God the praise. 
Be thankful in your heart to the Lord. Now, pay attention to the things that I've taught you earlier this week about your spiritual discipline. Deliverance is not just a simple little snap of the finger cure-all for every problem. Sometimes our problems are caused because we have undisciplined lives. Discipline your tongue. Discipline your eyes. Discipline your hands. Discipline your feet. Discipline your stomach. Discipline everything about you. Because that's the way to walk in freedom. Fill yourself with the things of God. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Have a consistent, faithful prayer life. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Praise and worship and rejoice before the Lord. You don't have to wait until you go into an assembly. Put on that tape at home. Play that music. Sing with it. Dance with it. Rejoice unto the Lord. Pray and believe God. Remember the person who becomes double-minded is taken away by the devil. The thing that keeps you single-minded is to stay steady in faith and trust in God. If you don't stay steady in faith and trust in God, then you become double-minded. The first chapter of James explains that. For it says ahead of verse 8 that a double-minded man becomes unstable. He says, believe God. When you ask for God, don't question. Don't waver. Don't doubt in what you've asked from God. Know that He will receive it. Don't be like the wave of the sea that's tossed to and fro. Start blessing others and quit thinking about yourself. That's too much of a luxury for you to afford. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.